Welcome to ForexTV.com's PM Exchange. It's Wednesday, February 6th. I'm Remy Hokey. Today I'm joined by Michael Wolfolk from the Bank of New York Mellon. Good afternoon, Michael. Yes, good afternoon, Remy. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you again for inviting me. Well, the focus this week has been on central bank rate announcements as well as global economic data. We're starting to see slowing growth not only here in the U.S., but also abroad in the U.K. as well as the Eurozone. So first of all, if we could start out broadly, and if you could tell us whether or not you expect to see U.S. dollar strength against the Euro and Euro, uh, the U.K. Sterling. Well, as, with respect to central banks, we already had the RBA meeting in mm -hmm. Australia earlier this week, the uh, RBA um, raised interest rates uh, 25 basis points. Uh, tomorrow we have the Bank of England. Uh, they're expected to cut interest rates by 25 basis points. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, that shouldn't be considered um, a done deal yet, however. Uh, there is a chance that they could wait for further uh, incoming data before uh, cutting again, uh, perhaps at its next meeting. <clears throat> the ECB is not expected to change interest rates. There are some in the market who are holding out hopes that because of some weak data that we've seen recently out of the Eurozone that uh, the ECB and Trichet's press conference could signal perhaps uh, uh, the potential for cutting rates uh, in the future. Uh, there I would uh, strike a note of caution really because uh, uh, the ECB council members have been uh, very uh, consistent uh, over the last month about uh, about this very point that uh, specifically Trichet has indicated he only has one needle on his compass that being to deliver price stability in the medium term he's concerned about upside risk to price stability uh, Axel Weber uh, several weeks ago coming out and saying uh, that uh, uh, market uh, chatter about uh, potential rate cuts from the ECB was, quote, wishful thinking. Uh, Garganis uh, from uh, Greece indicating that, uh, again, uh, upside risk to price stability is, is, is a grave concern of his. Uh, so I, I think, all told, uh, if anything, they continue to signal uh, concerns about inflation, whether it's money supply uh, or wage inflation. Certainly, uh, price inflation will remain and, and uh, will keep them, prevent them from taking on a more dovish uh, stance. Now, how does that affect uh, the, the dollar? Well, the, the dollar is benefiting right now uh, from uh, a, um, a culling of uh, year long positions in the marketplace following the uh, worse than expected time for payrolls result that we got on Friday. Uh, so we have something of a technical correction. You know, so I'm taking profit along euro positions. Uh, the sterling is being hit for more fundamental reasons, uh, probably being cut in the downdraft of foreign currencies against the U.S., but also is weakening in anticipation of the Bank of England putting interest rates tomorrow. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, euro, um, uh, again, is really the anti-dollar. Uh, so given the fact that uh, there is some risk in the marketplace right now, equities uh, continuing to come under pressure, particularly overseas, uh, that's good for the U.S. dollar in terms of the dollar getting a safe haven bid on risk aversion. So we're kind of flip-flopping from trading session to trading mm -hmm. session, whether or not we're risk tolerant or risk averse. And uh, right now, the, the, the flavor of the day is uh, risk aversion, and it's benefiting the dollar. So we, we see some uh, further dollar upside potential uh, in, in the coming trading session. Uh, as long as the ECB and Bank of England deliver as expected. Well, Michael, while we still have our focus on the central banks, I'd like to take a step back and talk about the RBA rate decision mm -hmm. earlier this week. Sure. Um, the RBA hiked by 25 basis points as widely expected to 7%. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and on Monday, we also saw um, the Aussie dollar against the U.S. currency hit a high of 91. But following the rate decision, we haven't seen that kind of rally in the Aussie dollar. So if you could give us your forward-looking uh, forecast for the Aussie dollar against the yen and the U.S. currency. Well, Remy, certainly the, uh, the, the reaction of the uh, Aussie dollar uh, earlier this week was in anticipation of uh, the RBA's right hike uh, that uh, in uh, financial markets in general, certainly foreign exchange markets, there's this phenomenon of uh, buying the rumor and then selling the facts. So I think in the lead up to uh, a widely anticipated rate hike, 
they were, they were buying uh, the currency, and uh, certainly uh, gold prices, commodity prices, uh, uh, are remain elevated and are supportive of the currency. Uh, now, uh, why did it uh, sell off? Why why is it remain below ninety cents? Mm -hmm. uh, since the uh, the RBA rate hike, uh, you know th this is uh, again. I, th I think there's a, a broader uh, a story here about uh, U.S. dollar strength, but I think also uh, that uh, a lot of these commodity currencies uh, are getting hit here over the last several trading sessions because of uh, risk aversion. Uh, you start to see that uh, with the yen. The yen has uh, gained against uh, most of the majors, uh, including the the, the U.S. dollar. Really, the, uh, the the best performer in the league tables uh, recently, uh, because of this risk aversion during periods of risk aversion. Not only does the dollar benefit, but uh, yen carry trades uh, get cut back, uh, benefiting the yen. So, uh, I would uh, continue to see in, the, in that current uh, scenario, uh, uh, the yen continue to strengthen against uh, to strengthen against the uh, Aussie. Uh, we have the uh, Aussie dollar expected to be in a range of about. Uh, Eighty-eight and a half cents to maybe ninety and a half cents. It's a relatively uh, broad range, uh, but then again, volatility has become uh, something of a commonplace since uh, the August liquidity crisis. And Michael, as you mentioned, we've been seeing uh, a flip-flopping of risk appetite, um, falling and um, rising, depending on what we see in U.S. equity markets as well as uh, in the global economic data front. But this weekend we'll be um, getting the G7 meeting in mm -hmm. Tokyo. Right. So if you could give us uh, your take on what you think will be talked about in relation to foreign exchange, if at all. Sure. Uh, yeah. Traditionally, Remy, the G7 communique, uh, which is really the uh, you know, the culmination mm -hmm. of uh, kind of the, the, that that meeting uh, on the foreign exchange side, uh, among other things, but that, that really details. Uh, the, the, the agreement among the members. And that communique typically came out on Saturday uh, in the afternoon uh, in, in Europe um, and uh, the morning in the U.S. Uh, the, the last several G7 meetings, the communique has been pushed back to uh, the evening, uh, Friday evening in New York. Uh, and um, uh, that may very well be the case uh, with this G7, that we get a communique out of Tokyo at uh, you know roughly you know 5:30 or so New York, uh, and uh, what we're anticipating is there to uh, in the foreign exchange section uh, to be you know, uh, uh, agreement uh, to continue to encourage uh, you know, flexible exchange rates with respect to uh, uh, um, markets, emerging markets that have uh, you know large uh, current account surpluses, um, especially China. <laughs> flexibility in the foreign exchange uh, rate uh, is uh, uh, in keeping with the resolution of the global imbalances problem, which remains a longer-term issue for the G7, uh, that uh, the G7 continue to uh, em embrace uh, you know, uh, reforms, uh, structural reforms uh, in um, uh, Europe and Japan to uh, uh, raise long-term growth. And finally, for the resolution of the global imbalances problem, the, the U.S., uh, of course, has to start living within its means, um, uh, notwithstanding the current fiscal uh, stimulus package, of course. Uh, so I, I, mean, I think that those points will be reiterated. I think that uh, though there, there has been some, t some talk about whether or not uh, the dollar has been oversold, particularly against the euro. Uh, I, I, I don't think that that issue will be raised. It wasn't raised at the last G7. Uh, I, I think that what is front and center for the G7 right now, Remy, is this liquidity crisis that has kind of morphed into a, a broader credit crisis. Uh, this is something that has seen a remarkable uh, intermeeting uh, efforts on behalf of uh, not only uh, the Fed, but the ECB, the Bank of England, even the Bank of Canada has been involved. Uh, and I, I think going forward, it's going to require a great deal of coordination to ensure that there's uh, you know, adequate uh, liquidity uh, in the system that uh, uh, as the uh, uh, CDO write-offs uh, continue to uh, unveil that uh, the, the financial system uh, remains uh, uh, not only liquid but uh, also uh, stable. Uh, financial market stability is, is truly the key right now. Uh, 
uh, and I think that you're going to see the G7 statement reflect uh, uh, ongoing concern uh, about the, uh, the liquidity crisis uh, and the uh, downdraft in the, the housing market in the U.S breaking over into the broader G7 in terms of growth and stability. So you'll see that, but uh, really no um, uh, anticipation of uh, trying to um, uh, artificially support the U.S. dollar, no uh, indication of a, uh, a desire to intervene, uh, and uh, really no concern about uh, the yen continuing to strengthen. Okay, Michael, last but not least before we wrap it up, uh, you mentioned the Bank of Canada, so I'd like to wrap up the discussion by touching on the dollar block currencies um, mm -hmm. of the Kiwi as well as the Canadian dollar. Sure. It appears as though um, the marketplace is starting to pay attention to slowdowns in uh, other economies aside from the U.S. So given what we've been seeing in the commodities, uh, especially crude oil, how do you see everything fit in, in and weighing on the Kiwi and uh, sure. Canadian currency going <coughs> forward? Well, our baseline scenario is for global growth to remain very strong this year mm -hmm. despite uh, the near zero uh, growth in the U.S. the first half of the year. The stimulus package and the monetary stimulus uh, in the pipeline is likely to uh, be expressed in terms of gro a growth surge in the second half of the year, but there's really nothing we can do about the first half of the year in the States. Nonetheless, global growth will remain strong and will keep energy and other commodity prices elevated. Uh, how this plays out on the commodity-linked currencies, the dollar block, uh, will be mixed. Um, probably the, the, the most favorable uh, will be uh, the Canadian dollar. It has a current account surplus compared to the current account deficits in Australia and in New Zealand. However, what's offsetting that it has the lowest in interest rates versus uh, Australia and New Zealand, with Australia having just recently hiked interest rates. I think that the fundamental economic backdrop probably puts the, uh, the uh, New Zealand in last place. Uh, I, I think that uh, Canada and uh, Australia you know, should uh, come in about 2 3 percent GDP growth for the year. Uh, so I, I, I do see the Canadian dollar continuing to make uh, kind of longer term progress against the U.S. dollar, perhaps ending the year about uh, 95 cents in uh, dollar Canada terms. Uh, Aussie dollar uh, will probably top out about 92 cents and then come back towards year end closer to where we are now, perhaps as low as uh, 87 cents. Uh, the Kiwi dollar, however, uh, despite uh, very, very impressive uh, interest rate differentials, I, I think that those uh, interest rates are likely to come off pretty quickly once the economy begins to falter. Uh, and uh, you, you could see something uh, you know, back to about 70 cents by the end of the year. Okay, Michael, thank you very much for coming on the show today, and thank okay. you for your analysis. Thank you very much, Remy. This has been your Forex News with Michael Wolfwood from the Bank of New York Mellon. Next up, we have your equities and commodities wrap up for the day. U.S. stocks pulled back after starting out strong. The major indexes ended in the red with the Dow Industrials down about half a percent on the day. On top of the week's sales report from Macy's, the latest comments from the Fed highlighted concerns about inflation. In today's U.S. data releases, which came in better than expected, the Labor Department said Q4 productivity grew by an annual rate of 1.8 percent. That's down from the 6 percent advance in Q3. Meanwhile, unit labor costs climbed 2.1 percent in Q4 from the decline of 1.9 percent in Q3. At the closing bell, the Dow Industrials fell 65.03 to settle at 12,200.10. The Nasdaq fell 30.82 or 1.33 percent to end at 2,278.75. And the S&P 500 fell 10 point in 18 points or 0.76 percent to close at 1,326.46. Over in the fixed income market, U.S. Treasury bonds declined as the latest data showed U.S. workers producing at a stronger than expected pace. The benchmark 10-year Treasury note declined with its yield at 3.62 percent, up from 3.56 percent late Tuesday. The 30-year long bond fell with its yield up at 4.37 percent from 4.33 percent late yesterday. And the two-year note also fell with its yield up at 1.96, up from 1.92 percent late in the previous session. Taking a look at energy, NYMEX crude oil futures pulled back, ending the session near $87 a barrel. Earlier today, the EIA reported that crude oil inventories climbed 7 million barrels in the latest week. This is the fourth consecutive week for a rise in crude inventories. 
March crude hit an intraday low of $86.80 and closed out the day down by $1.27 at $87.14 a barrel. In other petroleum products, March R bar of gasoline fell 2.48 cents to close at $2.23.99 a gallon. March heating oil declined 2.77 cents to end at $2.41.88 a gallon. Meanwhile, March Nat gas futures gained 5.2 cents on the day to close at $7.994 per million BTU. U.S. Nat gas inventory data will be released tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Over in the metals complex, gold futures surged in today's session, ending up above $900 an ounce. In the previous trading day, gold settled down at $890.30 an ounce. The U.S. dollar strengthened as well, and some safe haven buying supported gold today. April gold gained $14.70 to close at $905 an ounce on the NYMEX. Meanwhile, in other metals, March silver added 20.5 cents to close at $16.53 an ounce. March copper was up 9.7 cents, settling at $3.3090 a pound. This afternoon, we're joined by John Kilda from MF Global. He'll weigh in on energy futures and give us his short-term outlook. We had a uh, significantly bearish inventory report uh, this morning as the government uh, put out uh, and announced a significant increase, especially in crude oil uh, inventories. Uh, the 7 million barrel build uh, was well above uh, expectations, uh, as was the uh, bills that we saw really across the board uh, for refined, uh, from refined products as well. Uh, we had a very strong import week, 10.5 million barrels, uh, which was able to head, run headlong into a, a very low refinery operations uh, week, which we saw a sub-84% of capacity utilization. Uh, exacerbating the entire situation today uh, was a diminution in uh, gasoline demand for the week, a third week in a row where we've seen numbers below 9 million barrels per day, which is significant. Uh, this to us is, indi is an indication that the consumer uh, is being worn down and is pulling in their horns not only at the retail outlets but at the gasoline pump uh, as well. As a result, we saw a significant weakness in energy prices, uh, crude oil uh, down over a dollar, refined products down close to three cents. We are expecting this uh, weakness to continue. Uh, we are right now in, in pushing on a, a band of support that's between $86 and $87 a barrel in crude oil. Uh, we do believe the uh, economic data is sufficiently weak enough to help us break down through that uh, rather quickly here in the coming sessions and uh, week or so. Uh, we should push down to about $80 a barrel uh, where we see significant port support from uh, late last year. Uh, similar uh, price pullbacks uh, should occur in heating oil and RBOB gasoline. Uh, likely to see RBOB gasoline get down as low as 215 in the front month and a potentially uh, low of about 225 to 230 uh, in heating oil. All in all, the, uh, the surge that we saw at the end of the year up to the $100 barrel of mark quickly turned around on now two successive employment reports that are showing uh, contraction in the employment sector, big spike in continuing jobs last week, and the non-manufacturing-ism number uh, the other day uh, continuing to feed uh, the bearish tone uh, to the marketplace, uh, also meeting uh, uptick in production by Iraq and by all of OPEC for that matter, and having that oil flow here now that we've turned the corner into the new year. So can, there's significant pressure weighing on the complex, and the, it looks like the run for oil uh, is uh, over uh, for sure now. And uh, with the dollar uh, potentially strengthening here against the major currencies and a potential rate cut coming from the ECB uh, also should feed into lower crude oil prices. That was John Kilda from MF Global with his commodities commentary. And that's it for today's edition of PM Exchange. I'm Remy Hokey. Join us tomorrow morning for your latest news update right here on ForexTV.com. Have a good night.